Welcome to another episode of Wide Open Throttle. We have our standard group of panelists today, the uh, staff of Motor Trend you all know and love. Uh, we're going to start with Johnny, your very controversial head-to-head. -head. It's uh, Viper versus AMG SLS. Surprise or not a surprise that you picked the SLS system? Well, <laughs> um, I'm a little, what I am surprised at is that, you know, we've now tested a bunch of uh, various Vipers and they're pretty kind of all over the map in terms of uh, performance. This one being the slowest one we've tested, and we've tested another one that was much, much quicker. I knew it would be controversial. Yes, one cost $300,000, one cost significantly less than that. But I have my own personal $100,000 rule, and that's once you're over $100,000, the people that can afford that, money's not their number one concern like it is for most car buying decisions. And I was surprised that the heavier car with less power um, was faster in every way a car could be faster and was more fun. I'm surprised that anyone is surprised that Johnny was controversial. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I got it. This is true. But I, I drove both those cars yeah. a reasonable amount of yeah. distance as well. And you know, there was, you can, you can see the value in the SLS, just in, in the way the car feels. You know, everything on that car feels absolutely together. There's a solidity, there's a, a fluidity, there's a, a composure to the car that you just don't quite get in the Viper, which is, you know, you drive along and it's, oh my God, this thing's gonna kill me and my trousers are on fire and oh, I'm still slower than the SLS. <laughs> There's some serious drivability issues, but to me, the core of that car, the, this, it's angry, it doesn't like you, I don't buy that. I don't think a car has to be like that in order to be good to drive. And Ed, you actually had a good point that, that car does work when you're at 10 tenths. Yeah, like when oh, you're totally. on the limit, yeah. that car does work. But blast. the second you need to slow down, like I want to jump out, you know, because I don't want to think about anything else. Uh, I mean, I, uh, look, it's, I love the Viper because it is so raw and it is truly, I think it makes you a better driver the more you drive it. And there is a curve, a learning curve you have to go through because it is- it, it's a curve, it, it's like a 90 degree yeah, I mean, angle. Yeah, I mean, it is very intimidating when you first get in because it, it does all these things. There's all these movements. Like I, the one that we had when I drove it, I slammed on the brakes at 120 and I did one of these and I was like, Whoa, what is that? But then you realize that actually for all the chassis movements and all the noise and all that, that fear that you might feel, the car's not going anywhere. It no. is stuck to the road. And that's the hard part about the Viper is that you have to teach yourself that everything the car is telling you about how it's going to do things you don't like is wrong. And that if you just push through it and have a little faith, it will, it will stick, but that is a huge obstacle to overcome why, with 640 horsepower. Why do you have to tell yourself that? Why can't the car just tell you, hey, it's all good? You know? Well, I don't think this one we had was actually bolted together properly. Yeah. I, mean, I think, I think, that, that, was, I think yeah. that was There's part a lot of, of it. evidence that, yeah, a lot of evidence that it wasn't. Yeah, and, and I mean, the, the other thing too, um, with the Viper, I mean, remember, th this Viper compared to previous Vipers is outstanding. Well, sure. Absolutely, that's the point I was gonna make. I mean, I felt driving this car, you can drive it quickly, you can trust it a lot more than, than previous Vipers. It's not, it's not really going to surprise you. You know it's gonna move around a bit, but it, it feels much, much, much better. Yeah, and I the SLS, it's so wow. much better than the previous SLS. This thing, the, the Black Series, amazing. I mean, they've taken out some of the torque, they've managed to make the car smaller somehow mm -hmm. and improve visibility, which is not even possible. I mean, right. they, they didn't change anything, but I don't, I feel yeah, yeah, like yeah. I can, I own the road. Yeah, whereas, the seat's different, yeah, seat's different. When I was in the original SLS, like, you would go down turn eight and the corkscrew and you'd be like, well, I, I can't see anything. I would also just like to say this though, I mean, people, you know, it's not that like, I don't or we don't like the Viper. I actually really like the Viper quite a bit. It's just that when you do a head to head, you have a winner and you have a loser. Now you guys drove that on for your head-to-head, -head. you drove it on our SUV of the year loop, is that correct? That is correct, yeah. And I think you said it shall remain our SUV of the year loop. Probably Wonderful not. road for SUVs for uh, 600 plus horsepower rear wheel drive cars, you need a better road. But that, lead, that leads us to our next uh, discussion topic, which is what are some great roads that we've driven on? Let's identify them, let's talk about ones that people think are great driving roads that actually aren't. Well, I've got two favorites, and I'm pretty sure they'll be shared amongst the group. Angeles Crest, just above LA, and Highway 33 through Ojai, which goes on forever, has no traffic on it. 33. It beautiful. 33. Might be the, one of the best roads in the world. 33 is incredible, because the problem with Angeles Crest is everyone knows about it, yeah. and it's always filled with motorcycles, yeah. and it's just, it's not, it's not a fast road. Well, and it, and it goes somewhere. 33 goes absolutely nowhere. But best road in the world, really? I, 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 well, I am, I am impressed by California, having run you know, car magazines in Australia and in Great Britain, 
and now here. You know, Los Angeles is one of the best places in the world to have a car magazine because you can get with into great driving roads within a three hour drive of this office. Here, if you know where to go in, in California and other parts of the Western USA, you can find roads that are quiet and empty and you can drive for miles and miles and not see and anybody miles. and just have fun. <laughs> At speed. I mean, you, you hipped us to uh, Highway 12 in Utah, which, yeah. I mean, what a road. That's through the Escalante uh, National Park yeah. or whatever. Like, And there's no one on it. It's perfect. No one on it. But like, like Tale of the Dragon, right? Phenomenal road, really cool road. Kind of crowded on a weekend, but I went once, we left at, I mean, it was about 5.50 in the morning, and we ran to the top, didn't see another car. Had a perfect run up, and you get to the top, and the sun's all the way up, and there's the fog, and it's... Isn't it too tight, though? I heard Taylor Dragon has... Not in a 7. It's probably too tight for, like, a like a 370Z would probably struggle there, but a 7 is... Because I hear a lot about Taylor Dragon, I hear, but I hear some people say it's maybe better for a motorcycle, not so much for a car. The, the sevens were the sev the, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. There's they're, what they do is they, they totally leave you alone until a motorcycle goes into a tree, and then they just give everyone tickets. The Trans Fagarasan Pass in Romania, which uh, we drove before Top Gear found it, and uh, you know it's just a spectacular road that just winds and winds and winds. You get up the top, and there's shops and you know just by the side of the road you can get some food to eat and then you come back the other side through through a forest you know we're men of this world we travel a lot we do a lot of uh, launches everywhere what are the what are these roads around the rest of the world i know that you know the route napoleon very yep, favored absolutely. by a lot yeah, of manufacturers yeah. fantastic yeah. fantastic road but i like the autobahn I, i've got to go to the autobahn once a year and two years ago justin bell and i had a corvette zr1 driving it down from london down to munich and for the last 55 miles into Munich, I averaged, averaged 132 miles an hour. So, yeah, you know, every now and then, the Autobahn gods smile on you, and it is one of the greatest yeah, driving well, roads on Yeah, you saw 200, right? Oh, we did several runs to 200 miles yeah. an hour on the Autobahn. You just got to pick your time. Well, I'm curious, what do you guys think makes a great driving road? You know, this is going to sound horrible and very selfish, but no traffic. Like, yeah. hell yeah. is yeah. other cars. No yeah. Hell is other cars. So you've got to get, got to go where there's and, no cars. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a road that actually is not too tight, not too open, that, that has a variety of corners, yeah. some altitude change. One of the greatest car launches I have ever done in 30 years was the SLS launch in Mexico. And we went from Puebla down to Oaxaca on the old uh, Carrera Parent Panamericana roads. Now, the best part about this was we had the Federales running yeah, the gauntlet of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you could drive as fast as you want. There's definitely a point of diminishing returns with, with curves, because you can look on a map and you go, that road looks awesome. But there was a bunch of these near where I grew up there. You would look at them and you go, I got to drive up there. And you get up there and you realize that even in a good sports car, you're doing 15, 20 miles around each it's corner. It's like the front part of deck, like the front of deck. Yeah, it so. does depend, I think, on the on the car you are driving. Because I, you know, I did one of the best drives I've ever done was in a Mini Cooper S at the launch uh, up on Nascimento Road, up in your neck of the woods, up off of uh, near Big Sur, and that it was so tight. It was like it was like a WRC stage, but it was perfect for the for car. That, for yeah. Mini, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the key so one of the key uh, pieces to making a great driving road is elevation change. Yes. Yes. And you know, growing up in Australia, where there's miles and miles of, of you know, wide open space, you know, I've really come to appreciate mountainous areas like here in Southern California in the Western United States and in the Alps in Europe. Well, you notice every single road we mentioned was a mountain. Yeah. Everyone. And it's why we have on, you know, Best Driver's Car, we do, we do basically a hill climb because you learn so much on the yeah, way let's up keep and that on one the a way secret, down. Oh, that's <laughs> true. We don't mention that at all. Uh, what road? Right, right. Right. Changing gears a little bit, let's talk about uh, a rumor that we've heard that maybe uh, Chrysler is rethinking Dodge and that perhaps it's not going to be around in five years' time. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, Chrysler is looking at the, at the portfolio. I've heard stories that there is an active study underway in Auburn Hills looking at the future of the Dodge brand. And more radically, one of the scenarios is that the Dodge brand gets replaced by Alfa Romeo. Yeah. And in the US, that makes that noise. But in Europe, what's a Dodge? In Moscow and China? Who what cares to, about what Europe? This <laughs> America. Good point. Good point. America. Good point. Good point. But, 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 but Russia and China and India, where that's going to become the world car market pretty soon. But does Alpha have a better name? I mean... Well, that's an interesting question. You know, the last time uh, an Alfa Romeo ever pricked the uh, pop culture psyche in America, Dustin Hoffman was straight out of acting school. So, right. you know, there is no memory of what Alfa Romeo is, what it stands for. And in recent years, that's probably a good thing. Back in the early 60s, Alpha was 
basically like BMW. It was right. the affordable, lightweight, sporty, you know, sedans and, and uh, coupes and sports cars. They know Alfa Romeo has some value. Ferdinand Pieck has twice tried to buy Alfa Romeo from Fiat Chrysler, and that alone has made them think, well, maybe there is something to this brand. But they've got to figure out what it is, and then how does it work with Dodge on a global basis? So you could see maybe the logic working like this. Fiat is our mass market low-end brand, particularly in Europe. And at the other end, Chrysler is near premium. And, and I know there's a lot of work to be done on that. A whole other episode. It's a whole yeah, other yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. In the middle, maybe, maybe Alfa Romeo can be positioned as a global sporty brand, which leaves Dodge as what? Isn't everybody forgetting that like the red-blooded Americans will never ever let that happen? The the, the Dodge name going away like that. I mean, they they still face a huge problem. They weren't going to let Pontiac go. Pontiac, Oldsmobile, uh, Plymouth, uh, you know, Saturn. I mean, you, know, you still, still have, I mean, you still have, have Dodge Ram rams. truck guys calling them Dodge Rams. Yeah, but they're not. They're Rams. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I thought that was the rival. I mean, in racing and everything. I mean, Plymouth, you know, raced, you know, a bit in there too. But like, it was Dodge, Ford, Chevy. Where that was the American three. Like and you AMC, about, you know, the four. Yeah. The, you know, I mean, it like, was, like the world how changes. About, how about now? I mean, I guess mentioned Alfa Romeo needs to find what it stands for. But what does Dodge stand for right now? I think they are really thinking about what what Dodge could and should be. I agree with you. I think you know, that's a ballsy decision. Um, so, you know, I, I suspect what might happen is that you might end up with Dodge becoming this, this rump niche brand that really only is an American only brand, only a handful of cars. And maybe to keep the dealers happy, they start selling all the Alpha stuff as well. But wouldn't, but wouldn't, wouldn't Ram also be an America only brand? And it is why, an American. Yeah, but what I'm saying is why, why, would you, why would you introduce that as a brand if you're in, gonna also keep Dodge, and, and I agree, I think Dodge. And I would in, in say, why would you choose SRT? Uh, why wouldn't I you just turn Dodge into the performance brand, and why start SRT? I because totally it, agree with that too. SRT it, is now one car. Because they're probably gonna kill Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let's go with that. You flip it around and say, okay, they might be getting rid of them. If they were to keep them, what would you do with Dodge? What would you transform that into? I would make it the performance brand. I would put all, brand. you know, Challenger, Viper, you know, uh, make a legit Charger. They've already invested in this new brand, SRT. Are they going to kill that after four or five years? So have they left room for Dodge in, you know, the pie? It's going to depend on the leadership because right now, I don't see a, within the organization a, a major cheerleader for Dodge. I mean, they have the division heads, but they all bow to the wishes of Sergio. I think that's very clear. So there isn't like a like a Lutz type character or like a Piek that's gonna. If there's if there isn't somebody there to stand for Dodge, maybe they do go away. So, but hey, that's all conjecture. You know, this is what we do. We talk about stuff, <laughs> and we'll be talking about more interesting topics on the next episode of Wide Open Throttle. Stay tuned.